So again, thank you so much for coming. My name is Sarah Boleen. I'm the events coordinator here. And on behalf of the entire staff, um, I'm so pleased to welcome you. And I'm also so pleased to welcome Lynn Olson back to Politics and Prose tonight to discuss her new book, Those Angry Days, Roosevelt, Lindbergh, and America's Fight Over World War II. The book focuses on the battle between the interventionists and isolationists in the 18 months leading up to Pearl Harbor. And at the center of this controversy were two of the most famous men in America, President Roosevelt, who championed the interventionist cause, and aviator Charles Lindbergh, who, as an unofficial leader and spokesman for America's isolationists, emerged as the president's most formidable enemy. Lynn Olson is the author, as many of you know, of Citizens of London, Troublesome Young Men, and Freedom's Daughters, and she's also the co-author of two other books. We're so glad to have her back with us tonight. Please join me in welcoming Lynn Olson to Politics and Prose. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, very much. Can you all hear me? I will, I will yell if uh, need be. Um, I am delighted to be back here. Um, this is the best bookstore in the whole world. Uh, it used to be... It used to be our neighborhood bookstore. We used to live just about less than a mile away from here, and we're here all the time. I mean, I, I'm here, we're here, Stan and I are here with our daughter Carly, uh, and I won't tell you how old she is, but we used to come and, and bring her when she was three, four years old, I guess that's when, so that's how long we've been coming here. And I want to thank Politics and Prose for being so wonderful, such an incredible resource for this city. Um, and again, thank you so much. And thank you all for coming. I'm, I'm blown away. Um, there are friends, old friends, new friends in this audience, and uh, um, I appreciate so much your being here. I'd like to start out tonight by reading a quotation from Winston Churchill, which is, you can always count on the Americans to do the right thing after they've tried everything else. <laughs> It's a wonderfully funny line, typically Churchillian, but there are a lot of emotions behind it, exasperation, anger, and bitterness among them. Churchill clearly felt all those emotions in the desperate days of 1940 and 1941, when he and his country were the last ones in Europe standing against Hitler. The British had been bombed night after night by the Luftwaffe, while German submarines operated at well in the Atlantic sinking vast amounts of merchant shipping headed for Brit Britain and slowly strangling British supply lines. This tiny island was very close to defeat. In the words of Field Marshal Allenbrook, Lord Allenbrook, Britain's top military leader during the war, we were hanging on by our eyelids. The United States, meanwhile, the only country that could save Britain, was sitting on the sidelines debating and debating and debating what to do. Several of my earlier books have touched on this period, but they've been written primarily from the point of view of Churchill and the British, and in Citizens of London, from the viewpoint of several Americans who were doing their best to help save Britain. In this latest book, Those Angry Days, I decided to take a look at what was going on in the United States during the years 1939 to 1941. What I found was an extraordinary story, one that I realized I didn't know very much about, and one that I don't think most people do. Historians have discussed the issues of isolationism and interventionism in great detail, but they've tended to focus on questions of policy. <coughs> Most of them have not really looked at the human story of this time, the ferociousness of the fight, the nail-biting suspense over whether Britain would in fact be saved, the extreme polarization in the United States, not unlike today, that tore apart friendships and ripped apart families. The passions back then were at a fever pitch. Eric Severide, who was a young CBS correspondent at the time, called the period bitter and heartburning. Arthur Schlesinger, Jr., who as a 20-something graduate student was caught up in this struggle, called it the most savage political debate in my lifetime. In his autobiography, Schlesinger wrote, 
Though historians have, de have dealt with the policy issues, justice has not been done to the searing personal impact of those angry days. And as you probably guessed, I uh, took the title of the book from that Schlesinger quote. During these two years that I write about, what was then called the Great Debate raged throughout the nation, from the White House and Congress to bars, beauty parlors, offices and classrooms, in the biggest of cities and the smallest of towns. Millions of people, from college students to, to housewives to Wall Street lawyers, were caught up in the struggle, knowing that whatever its outcome, their lives were bound to be profoundly affected. At stake was not only the future of Britain, the survival of Britain, but also the shape and future of America. What was the U.S. to be? A fortress country that refused to break out of its isolationist shell, still believing it must be free from foreign commitments? Those who shared that belief argued we must be ready to fight for the defense of our own nation, but for nothing and no one else. On the other hand, those who supported intervention said we could no longer evade international responsibility. The times were too dangerous. Britain's survival was absolutely essential for our own security and welfare. They felt that if the British were defeated and Hitler controlled all of Europe, he would move to dominate Africa and infiltrate South America, which would then pose a serious threat to the U.S. We would have little chance to survive as a free and democratic society. Others in the interventionist camp emphasized what they saw as America's moral obligation to stop Hitler, the embodiment, as they saw it, of pure evil. How could we stand on the sidelines, they argued, while Nazi Germany conquered sovereign countries, <coughs> went on a rampage against Jews, and threatened to wipe out Western civilization as we know it? At the center of the debate, um, were the two most famous men in America, President Franklin D. Roosevelt and Charles Lindbergh, the young man who had mesmerized the world in 1927 when he flew alone across the Atlantic. FDR wanted America to come to the aid of Britain, while Lindbergh, who became the unofficial leader and spokesman for the country's isolationists, believed that the United States must stay clear of the war and focus solely on its own defenses. Because of who these men were, both of them had a huge impact on public opinion. Actually, the two of them already had a history, and this is something I didn't know when I started my research. Five years before 1939, so in other words, 1934, uh, just a year after Roosevelt had taken office, Lindbergh had challenged Roosevelt's cancellation of airmail delivery contracts uh, that had been granted to the country's largest airlines by FDR's Republican predecessor, Herbert Hoover. Roosevelt said there had been fraud and bribery in the granting of those contracts, and he ordered the U.S. Army Air Corps to start delivering the mail. Lindbergh at that time was an advisor to one of those airlines, and he publicly criticized FDR for ending the contracts without giving the companies a chance to respond. He also warned, and this is important, that Air Corp uh, flyers didn't have the experience and the right type of instruments in their planes to take on this incredibly hazardous job, uh, which involved flying in all extremes of weather, in uh, blizzards, in thunderstorms, at night, etc. Well, as it turned out, he was right. In the four months that Army pilots flew the mail, there were 12 men killed, 66 crashes, and as one writer put it, untold humiliation for the Air Corps and for the White House. Very soon, the airlines were back delivering the mail. This was Roosevelt's first major public relations defeat, and he never forgave Lindbergh for that. I personally think that the bad feelings left over from that earlier conflict were part of the reason for the extremely bitter confrontation between them in the years that I write about. One of the things that really surprised me when I was doing um, research for the book was how brutal this debate was for everyone. 
FDR said it was going to be a, quote, dirty fight, unquote, and he did a great deal personally to make it so. He was convinced that the isolationists, particularly Lindbergh, posed a major threat to the country and himself. And he, and he and his supporters embarked on a campaign to destroy their credibility, their influence, and their reputations, calling them, among other things, subversives, fifth columnists, and even Nazis. The President also authorized the FBI to wiretap and investigate not only Lindbergh, but also a good number of the President's other critics. In addition, FDR allowed a covert British intelligence organization to operate in America, in Rockefeller Center, um, actually the building that's directly opposite St. Patrick's Cathedral on Fifth Avenue uh, in New York. I'm sure many of you have walked by it or even been in it. It's called the International Building. This operation, this British operation, had the bland, innocuous title of British Security Coordination. And its main job was to get America into the war, no matter how. It carried on its own dirty tricks campaign, spying on anti-war groups, digging up political dirt on congressional isolationists, wiretapping phones of unfriendly diplomats in Washington, and by that I mean um, Germany, um, Italy, Japan, and Vichy France planning propaganda in U.S. newspapers, and even forging documents. We were a neutral country at that point, so of course all of this was extremely illegal. The playwright Robert Sherwood, who became a Roosevelt speechwriter in 1940, later wrote that if the isolationists had known the full extent of the secret alliance between the United States and Britain, their demands for the impeachment of the president would have been a great deal louder. I hasten to add um, that Lindbergh and the other prominent isolationists were not blameless, to put it mildly, in this Donnybrook, although they were not nearly as good at it uh, as the interventionist side. They portrayed FDR as a dictator, much along the same lines as Mussolini and Hitler, and they claimed he was responsible for destroying free speech in America and rushing it into war without the people's consent. During those two years, Washington, again like today, was a real snake pit filled with intrigue and infighting and intimidation. Just to give you one example, there were a number of high-ranking officers in the Army, Navy, and Air Corps who were doing their best to sabotage, sabotage the policies of FDR, who was, after all, their commander-in-chief. Many of them were isolationists. Now that surprised me. I mean, maybe I'm naive, but I thought the military would be militaristic. Um, but, but in that period, many, many of them were not. They were convinced that we had made a mistake in getting into World War I, that America had, had, uh, that it had been a disaster for America, and they were convinced that the country should stay clear of World War II, at least until we had built up our own defenses, uh, which at that point were pretty pitiful. Several of them leaked top secret information to isolationist members of Congress and to Lindbergh and other key leaders in the anti-war movement. Among them was an army colonel named Truman Smith, who was General George Marshall's chief advisor on Germany, George Marshall, of course, being the head of, of the army. Um, and at the same time, Truman Smith was one of Lindbergh's closest friends and was actively working with Lindbergh in the isolationist cause. But the biggest leaker of all turned out to be none other than General Hap Arnold, the Air Corps Chief of Staff, who just before Pearl Harbor was implicated in the leak of one of the administration's most closely guarded military secrets, a contingency plan for all-out war against Germany. That bitter polarization um, that existed in Washington was echoed throughout the country. In those angry days, I write a lot about Charles Lindbergh's wife, Anne, who was caught right in the middle of this very nasty fight. Anne Morrow Lindbergh was the daughter of Dwight Morrow, a former J.P. Morgan, Morgan partner who then became a U.S. ambassador and then a senator. Anne Lindbergh had grown up as part of the East Coast establishment, which tended to be pro-British and interventionist. Because she supported her husband in his isolationism, although not really ever convinced that it was the right thing to do, she found herself estranged from virtually all her old friends and acquaintances, 
all the people she had grown up with, who looked on Lindbergh, in her words, as the Antichrist. All of this took an enormous emotional toll on her. What was particularly painful for Anne was the split within her own family. Her mother was a leading activist for interventionism, and her sister Constance, who was really Anne's best friend, worked with her husband, a Brit named Aubrey Morgan, who became one of the top propagandists for the British government in the United States. Morgan's job was to do everything he could to get the U.S. into the war, which was the very thing Charles Lindbergh was trying to prevent. I should say, as an aside to this, that surprisingly, Charles Lindbergh and Aubrey Morgan stayed very good friends throughout the war. Uh, they, somehow, um, Anne Lindbergh's family, despite this great division, uh, was, well, they were determined not to let it um, sever the family ties, and, and they, they actually managed to do it. And how they did it, I have no idea, but they did. FDR was caught in the middle, too, between interventionists who wanted him to do more, much more, than he had been doing for England, and isolationists who wanted to focus on the U.S. Conventional wisdom has it that Roosevelt, knowing full well that America must enter the war, but hamstrung by strong isolationist public opinion, was intent on edging the country toward getting into the war, and often, and often devious by indirect and often devious methods. But actually, it's far from clear that the president, while certainly determined to help Britain, ever wanted or intended that America go to war, at least in the sense of sending troops. When we think of FDR now, we think of his bold leadership, which he certainly did exhibit in the first years of his presidency and then again after America entered the war. But during those critical years, those two years, 39 to 41, while he was forceful in his repeated calls for action to help Britain and end German aggression, he repeatedly procrastinated in making su such action a reality. So what happened to make him so cautious and hesitant? You have to remember that just less than two years before this, he had suffered the two worst political defeats of his presidency. He'd been humiliated by Congress in his effort to pack the Supreme Court, and then humiliated by voters in his unsuccessful effort to purge some of his con conservative Democratic opponents in the 1938 congressional election. Both of these defeats were absolutely devastating for Roosevelt psychologically. It was the lowest point of his presidency, and it coincided with the period in which Hitler and Mussolini stepped up their march toward war. The president was punch drunk from the punishment he had suffered at the hands of Congress and at the polls, and he temporarily, and I repeat temporarily, lost his confidence that once had been so absolute that the American people would always stand behind him. From then on until Pearl Harbor, he tended to exaggerate the power of congressional isolationists and was very reluctant to challenge them. In the spring of 1941, FDR's private pollster, Hadley Cantrell, reminded the president that every time he had pr proposed a bold move, like the Lend-Lease Aid Program, which, parenthetically, was one of the great successes of his presidency, and in fact was his idea, as well as the plan to give 50 old U.S. destroyers to England, a large majority of Americans had supported him. And Cantrell was sure that a similar majority would back FDR now, even if he called for stronger initiatives, including going to war. In one memo, Cantrell used capital letters to make his point when he wrote, what the people want is to be told what to do. <laughs> Roosevelt, however, refused to accept that argument. The more favorable the poll results were, were for him and his policies, the less he seemed to believe them. He was clearly more influenced by his own more pessimistic assessment of public opinion, which he saw reflected in the words and the actions of the diminished but still potent isolationist bloc in Congress. But I should also point out that he did not mind being pushed by others to do more. In fact, throughout this period, 
he was urged on by several private citizens groups, which mounted campaigns to educate and mobilize American public opinion in favor of intervention. The work of these organizations, according to one prominent interventionist, allowed Roosevelt to move gingerly in the direction of saving his sleeping country. Interventionist groups played a critical role in the administration's decision to send those 50 old destroyers to, to Britain. They also helped persuade Roosevelt to make important changes in his cabinet, and they were the chief force in convincing a highly skeptical FDR and Congress to approve the first peacetime draft that this country had ever had in the summer of 1940, an extremely controversial step to take in the midst of a presidential campaign. Two months before that draft bill was passed, a coalition of political amateurs hijacked the largely isolationist Republican Party and at one of the most exciting party conventions in American history, engineered the presidential nomination of Wendell Wilkie, a former businessman who had announced his candidacy only seven weeks before. If there's a hero in my book, it's Wendell Wilkie. He was a strong interventionist, unlike most of the regulars in the Republican Party. And he supported much of, of FDR's foreign policy, even though politically, it cost him dearly. He privately backed the destroyer deal, and he publicly supported the peacetime draft, much to the anger and dismay of GOP leaders. After he lost in November 1940, instead of pulling a Mitt Romney-like disappearing act, <laughs> Wilkie went on the radio to announce to the American people, we have elected Franklin Roosevelt president. He is your president. He is my president. We will support him. Go figure. <laughs> That's exactly what he did. Just a few months later, to the fury again of the Republican old guard, Wilkie endorsed the legislation in creating Lend-Lease. Roosevelt would later describe Wilkie as a godsend to this country when we needed him most. The president also acknowledged that Wilkie's support for Lend-Lease and the draft both of which were crucial in winning the war, might well have made the difference uh, between victory and defeat in the passage of those bills in Congress. Before I close, I'd like to talk about another citizens group, this one on the isolationist side, and that is America First, which was the most vocal and effective isolationist organization in the country. The story of America First and how it was created was, for me, one of the most interesting and surprising things I learned uh, while I was writing this book. When most people think of America First, um, I think they think of it as the embodiment of conservative Midwestern isolationism. But actually, it was born on the campus of Yale University, the brainchild of a group of top campus leaders, most of whom were moderate to liberal. The founders of America First included Gerald Ford, future president of the United States. Potter Stewart, future Supreme Court Justice. Sergeant Shriver, first head of the, future first head of the Peace Corps. And Kingman Brewster, future president of Yale, and quite ironically, future US ambassador to Great Britain. Three examples of America First supporters at the time included a Harvard senior named John F. Kennedy, a Cornell University student named Kurt Vonnegut, and a precocious student at Phillips Exeter named Gore Vidal, who founded a chapter of America First at, this, at his prep school. Today, World War II is known as the Good War, a necessary conflict to save Western civilization from the evil of Nazi Germany. But in the years leading up to Pearl Harbor, the extent of that evil was not as obvious as it is now and millions of American college students who would be among the first to fight revolted against the very thought of U.S. participation in another bloody European war. It was very much like the 1960s in Vietnam. Shortly after America First was organized, it moved its headquarters to Chicago. And from then on, most of its leaders would be Midwestern businessmen, 
whose social and political views were considerably more conservative than those of its young founders. By the time of Pearl Harbor, most of the Yaleys who had founded America First had drifted away from the organization. When the United States finally entered the war, they, along with the vast majority of other college anti-war activists, immediately enlisted in the fight. The creation of America First, the way it was done, underlines one of the most interesting aspects of this time in our country how so many ordinary Americans got involved in this debate and had an effect on its outcome. As I said before, millions of people, not just college students, but millions of people all over, became involved in the fight, which for all its bitterness and all its anger was a real exercise in democracy. Everyone got a chance to make his or her case, and as a result, the pros and cons of U.S. involvement in World War II were carefully and thoroughly weighed against one another. By the time of Pearl Harbor, the American people were well aware they would have to pay a heavy price if they entered the war. But most had come to the conclusion that it was going to be necessary. According to polls in late 1941, a substantial majority of the U.S. population now regarded defeating Nazism as the biggest job facing their country. A similar majority preferred U.S. entry into the war to a German victory over Britain. In other words, the American people were no longer isolationists. That psychological and emotional preparation was one major reason, in my opinion, for the immediate unity of the country once war was declared against Japan, Germany, and Italy. After all the bitter conflict of the previous two and a half years, America was finally ready to claim its future. Thank you very much. Um, now I'd like to uh, take any questions, and um, I'd like to remind you, if you would please go to the um, microphones on either side. Thank you. Uh, that was wonderful. Thank I'm you. sorry I was a little late. Uh, maybe you mentioned this already, but what part did anti-Semitism play in, in the development of the America Firsters? I know that Lindbergh and uh, Kennedy, Kennedy the father, who was our ambassador to England, were in fact anti-Semites. Um, the, the, everybody heard the question. Um, I didn't uh, get into that because there's so much. You, you didn't miss anything. I, um, you know, there's so much to cover about this book, sure. um, and I figured there would be questions about it. Um, America first. Anti-Semitism didn't play a role in the development of America First. As a matter of fact, those Yale students that I mentioned, particularly Kingman Brewster and McGeorge Bundy, who was not a, not a founder of America First, he actually was on the other side, both of them were Yale students, and they led a campaign at Yale to admit more um, Jews, uh, to get more Jewish refugees from Europe, um, um, obviously to no, with no success. Um, but when America First was founded, it attracted a lot of anti-Semites to the organization, which the organization um, realized and uh, tried a little bit to prevent, uh, but not very much. I mean, it, America First had a very small national staff, and they had all these chapters all over the country, and they didn't keep control of that of those chapters, and many of them were... Um, had a lot of anti-Semites -Semi uh, as members, and uh, but I, I like also like to to make a comment about this. And you're absolutely right um, about Lindbergh. He uh, gave that famous or infamous speech at Des Moines in September 1941, in which he said that the three main uh, groups trying to get America into the war were the Roosevelt administration, the British, and American Jews. Um, and, I mean, he was obviously branding Jews, American Jews, as the other. You know, that, the, um, that basically they were un-American is, is what he was saying. Uh, but his, his uh, feelings, his sentiments uh, were quite uh, common in the United States during that period. There was a exactly. very deep streak of anti-Semitism um, throughout the country. Um, you know, in Washington, the State Department and War Department uh, were f um, had a lot of people who, who shared those feelings. Um, and, you know, and so 
I never defend uh, Charles Lindbergh and, w and what he said, but I just want to point out that he was not alone in, in sharing those feelings. Thank you. With Charles Lindbergh having crossed the Atlantic in 1927, I would think he might have had a little more interest in the European scene. Do you have any further reflections on that? Um, that's a really good question. Um, you know, wh how he felt about Europe. As a matter of fact, um, he left the United States. He took his country to the, uh, in, in 1935, his country, his family, um, which then consisted of his wife Anne and their second son, uh, John, um, to Europe to get away from the press. Um, this was after the kidnapping and murder of his first son, um, and uh, I describe in, in the book a lot, I mean, this is obviously nothing new, but I mean, from the time he made that, that flight, uh, he was besieged by the press and the public. Um, he hated that. He hated the, the, the publicity, and he, and he refused to go along with it. And the more he, he did that, the more the press was insistent that uh, uh, they, you know, they followed him everywhere. And, and Ann Lindbergh in her diaries um, and her letters talks very feelingly about how she felt, she and Charles felt like animals in a zoo, like monkeys in a zoo. You know, they would walk down the street and they would be besieged by, by people and they could never go anywhere. Um, and so it, w it was bad, but then when their son, Charles Jr., was kidnapped and killed, he basically started, I think, uh, conflate, he, equating his own situation with the state of the country. In other words, um, he felt that, um, Ameri he said that Americans no longer um, respected the rights of others. They no longer uh, really cared about the law. And so he took um, his family, as I said, to England and then France, and, that, and they lived there um, f um, until 1939, actually. Um, and so he did know Europe, but on a very limited scale. I mean, he was always reclusive. He never mingled, for example, with the British, the ordinary British. Um, whenever he would socialize, it was with the upper crust. It was with members of the cha uh, Neville Chamberlain's government, you know, with the royalty, all of whom were not exactly uh, <clears throat> anti-German um, at that time. So he lived on a very rarefied level. I mean, he, he Charles Lindbergh, it's hard to... He really had very little kind of empathy with other people. He was a technocrat. You know, he valued technical expertise, technological expertise. He valued experts. He thought the Germans were experts, particularly in aviation. And that's what he, what he cared about. Uh, and so, and he, so he, you know, there was very little empathy, personal empathy toward people. I mean, it was all, he was in his, he was, you know, cerebral. He was very, a very detached man. Um, somebody wrote, and I think this is a wonderful description of him, that he was a hypersens hypersensitive man who was insensitive to others. And I think that's a, a really brilliant description of, of Charles Lindbergh. Can you describe how you write your method of writing and how you do your research? Uh, a little a day all at once or what? Oh. <laughs> um, well, I do my research basically, well, I read a lot. Uh, obviously, um, I do my basic research in prime in archives around the country. And this, in this, for this particular book, uh, it was all basically in America, um, in the United States. I didn't really travel. Uh, one of the nice things about concentrating on this period and and you know a couple of countries is that I have a store stored bank of knowledge so that I don't have to start from the beginning and I can, you know, build on what I already know. Um, in terms of research, I did a lot at the FDR library. Um, and anybody who's ever done any research there knows it is one of, the, you know, maybe the best uh, research library, at least for me, um, at the Library of Congress, et cetera. In terms of writing, it's a very drawn out process. I don't know how to describe how I write. I sit down in the morning at 7.30 and I, you know, kind of don't get up until about 2.30. Um, it's, you know, I, I arrange notes. Um, it, it's, it's a very boring process, kind of like dredging coal or something. I mean, I, I do not like writing. I do not like it. I like research. Um, it is drudgery for me. Um, but at the same time, you know, when I get into stories, one of the reasons I write about 
people so much is because it's 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 fun to write about people. You know, it's you know you can you have to write about issues and events, and, and I use people to to just to illustrate them. But I much prefer writing about people and their lives, and and so that's fun for me. But I'm sorry, it's it's very I I really can't describe how I do it. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Uh, have you any uh, comment to make about the story that continues to live on today that Roosevelt was not surprised by the <laughs> bombing of Pearl Harbor? Um, all I can say is that I've done a lot of research about this period, you know, both from the from the uh, viewpoint of England, as I said before, and and now, and I. I find no evidence that he did, uh, that he knew anything about it. I mean, Roosevelt, as, as many of you know, is, um, was an incredibly secretive man. Um, he never wrote anything down. He never talked to anybody about, you know, what he was thinking or doing. Um, but, uh, you know, it would take too long to really go into why I don't think uh, that he did. But I, I'm pretty convinced that he did not know. Uh, that the Japanese were, were going to bomb Pearl Harbor. They obviously knew, the White House obviously knew the Japanese were on the march, as the British did. Uh, but they, um, did, I believe, didn't really know where. Hi, I'm so. Jerry Elliott. I live at uh, Ingleside at Rock Creek. Mm -hmm. Would things have unspooled any differently if Hitler had not declared <laughs> war on us first? Uh, that's a really good question. It's, it's a what-if question. I really obviously don't know the answer, but um, I don't know. I mean, I, I honestly don't know. I don't think uh, Roosevelt would have, if Hitler had not declared war then, I, we would not have gotten into the war immediately against Germany, I don't believe. Um, I mean, the pressure in the U.S. obviously would be to go after Japan. After all, they're the ones that attacked us. Uh, and and not Germany. And if that had happened, uh, I'm not sure what have ha what would have happened to, to to Britain and to the Soviet Union. Um, we we just really don't know. We do know that that Roosevelt was pressured by members of his administration, by members of his cabinet after Pearl Harbor, to declare war not only on Japan but on Germany too. Uh, in, uh, Henry Stimson, the Secretary of War, was the main. Uh, person pushing this, and, and Roosevelt said no, no. And so for three very, very long days, everybody waited uh, until, you know, Hitler declared war. It was really, uh, it was really one of the most stupid things he did during the war, uh, obviously. Um, but, you know, who knows? We yes, ma'am. You've now written several books on this same period. When you first started writing about the period, did you have a general conception of the various issues and personalities through which you wanted to approach it, or did one book sort no. of lead you to another? It's, it's the second. Um, my husband is where? Stan? St Stan Cloud is, is my co-author on two books. Um, and it, it really... we. We, our first book was called The Murrow Boys, and it was about Edward R. Murrow and the correspondence, correspondence he hired to create CBS News uh, before and during World War II. And, and much of the action of the book takes place in London um, in the early part of the war because that's where Murrow made his name. And I just became fascinated uh, principally with England during that, that era. You know, this, this little country, as I said, standing alone against Hitler, thanks to Winston Churchill, who, who came to power on the very day Hitler launched his blitzkrieg of, of uh, Western Europe. I mean, how, how, how could you better that? I mean, it, it's such an amazing story. And, and I kept finding little aspects of it, or big aspects of it, that I didn't think had been covered and had been written about. For example, um, in the book Troublesome Young Men, I write about a group of mostly Tory MPs who, who basically rebelled against Chamberlain and helped bring um, Winston Churchill to power. So it, 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 there, were, there was no thought out plan for these books at all. They just one came right after another. Any other questions? Yes. Did you mention that uh, Lindbergh ended up flying bombing missions and providing intelligence uh, to US military? and that his wife wrote a book or a little pamphlet after the morning speech opposing this thing. And on a lighter side, I think he liked Europe because later he went and started his family. <laughs> That's <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the two points were, um, um, you know, what happened 
what happened during the war, and and I do talk about that in the book. Um, that you know. Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, he he asked about do I cover in the book the fact that Lindbergh actually went to Europe uh, during the war and flew um, combat missions uh, f for the U.S. Um, unofficially. Uh, and the, and it, yes, it, it was in the Pacific. It wasn't in the, in in the, in the European theater. And the second question. Well, I'll I'll answer that and then we'll talk about the the second question. Uh, FDR absolutely refused to let Lindbergh into the military. Um, after Pearl Harbor, Lindbergh, Lind Lindbergh actually behaved impeccably. Once um, the war began, once Pearl Harbor had happened, uh, he stopped talking politics. He had he said nothing negative about the administration. He supported the war effort. Um, but again, as I referred to the the feud before, that feud was still very active um, after Pearl Harbor, and and. Roosevelt refused to allow him to, to go into the military. Um, and so he worked as a civilian consultant uh, to various aviation companies here in the U.S. Uh, for a while. And then his military friends. He had a lot of friends in the military. In fact, probably, I mean, well, I won't say Marshall, but certainly Hap Arnold on down, uh, who said, um, well, why don't you come and fly? Uh, and and uh, he said, well, I can't. You know, I'm not allowed. And he said, um, and, and basically his friend said, well, Roosevelt need never know. Um, and so he went to the Pacific uh, as a civilian consultant. Um, and the commanders, the commanders out there turned their, t turned their heads, and he actually flew combat missions. Uh, and in fact, I think uh, shot down at least one zero um, and came close to being shot down himself. And by all accounts, he was never happier. Charles Lindbergh belonged in a cockpit. That's where he really belonged. And from, all, from people who flew with him said he was just in seventh heaven um, flying again. I mean, there's one, there's one wonderful story uh, in the book where he's flying with a bunch of, um, of young kids who are you know, in their 20s or maybe in their teens. And he's quite slow in, in bringing up his landing gear or whatever. Uh, and one of the young pilots radioed to him, radioed to him and said, Lindbergh, something you you got to remember, you ain't flying the spirit of St. Louis anymore. <laughs> um, so he was there for several months, um, and uh, whether or not the administration ever found out, um, I don't know. But but he was allowed to stay. The the second part of the question was uh, that he liked Europe later on because he went back and had several other families there, and those of you who know the story. Um, about 10 years ago, it came out that he had, he did, in fact, have uh, relationships with three German women um, from about 1964 to when he died in 1971 and, and fathered seven more children. Um, uh, and it was all top secret until, as I said, about 10 years ago, uh, when the children of one of the women discovered uh, who their father really was. And his children here in the United States knew nothing about this. Um, and as you can imagine, it was a t tremendous shock. Um, but it, it's just one aspect of one of the strangest, most conflicted men I think I have ever written about. Um, so, yes. What happened, what happened to America first? Actually, actually, uh, Go ahead, uh, microphone. Uh, um, L let me take this question and then, and then I'll and then I'll answer. Um, you've written about <clears throat> a very intense debate during the years before Pearl Harbor, uh, a wide range of opinion, and yet um, I've lived in all the years since then, and I can count on one hand the number of people, uh, the number of Americans who don't think that American uh, World War II was right and necessary and inevitable. Um, I wonder. Uh, do you see that? Do you think there's a question? I, I have just three thoughts I'd like to ask you about. Would Hirohito have been a worse governor for China than Mao? Would Hitler have been a worse governor for the Soviet Empire than Stalin? And would our Atlantic and Pacific Oceans not have protected us from Germany as well as from Russia? Do you think it was necessary? I do think it was necessary, absolutely. Um, um, 
you know, I'm not, I'm not going to get into who's worse, Hitler or Stalin. Uh, but I, I don't. I don't think that, that the oceans would have protected us. I mean, and, and, and I'm not going to get into it because we don't have time, but on so many levels, even, even if Hitler, I mean, even if Germany had not, you know, infiltrated Africa or, um, or South America, if they controlled Europe, they would have controlled um, the Atlantic, they would have a lot of control over the, the Atlantic Ocean. And, um, and anybody who controlled the ocean you know, it was, was presenting a big threat. Um, you know, they would have controlled a lot of natural resources that we needed. Um, there are many, many ways that we could have, uh, you know, faced great, great danger without actual invasion uh, on our shores. And, and I do think, yes, I absolutely do think it was necessary. Um, and this, this uh, lady asked me, and I'll, it's a very brief answer. She asked me what happened to America first after the war. They disbanded immediately after Pearl Harbor. And, vir and they all, all the leaders of America First supported the war effort. Um, questions quickly? Okay. Um, yes, sorry. Returning to an earlier answer you gave about uh, your fascination with this period, are there some uh, ideas you have for future books? <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, I do have a contract, but it's World War I. Oh. I'm 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 uh, moving away from uh, um, uh, from this period, and because I, I I mean I think I've played it out. As I mean I may go back sometime, but I I think that I've you know written what I need to write about that period. But World War One is still kind of an un, at least for me is uncharted territory. So that's what I'm going to be looking at. Um, anything in particular? Um, I'd rather not actually okay. talk about it if you don't Just mind. Curious. Thank you. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, a couple of uh, comments about what you, uh, the, the hesitancy you attribute uh, to Roosevelt in, in, in helping uh, 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 the British and the setbacks he received during the 30s. Uh, he did run for an unprecedented third term uh, in, in spite of the setbacks, and most of all, he had the American Navy doing the work of the British fleet in the Atlantic. Uh, our destroyers were tracking uh, German submarines and escorting uh, British convoys uh, to a certain point where they met up with the British escorts. Okay. Um, the British Navy was actually doing the British Navy's work in the Atlantic. I mean, uh, we didn't... Uh, those those uh, old destroyers, yes, they, they were helpful. But we didn't start convoying. We didn't start protecting until just a couple of months before Pearl Harbor. So you know we were fairly late in in that game. We certainly the the U.S. Navy uh, was involved. It was the first service to actually be involved in an undeclared war. Uh, but it was it was late. So thank you very very much. I really appreciate it. <laughs>